like this uh, shirt I'm wearing today. I don't like the color. It's almost like a Notre Dame puke green. Uh <laughs> No, no, today is brighter. Why would you say that before our next guest? Oh, I'm sorry. How do you say that before our next guest? Let's bring him in. You got to pick and choose. You met MSU, didn't you? Oh, I met Michigan State. Oh, I'm so sorry. Brady Quinn, how are you, my friend? I bring my brother around you, and this is the treatment he gets. Here's the funny thing. Look at look at look at Braylon playing this off. He's playing this off like he just set this whole orchestrate this whole thing up, trying to make sure. It's all right. I, I, I sent yeah. a little photo. It was the only photo I had of, of a new addition to the family. So you, you're going to have to deal with that as well. Hey, co- by the way, congratulations, Yes, sir. Man. You get hey, any, hey, I mean, it doesn't get much better than go. that. Baby uh, cab. You getting any sleep, Dad? Four times over uh, now. Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. I mean, he's he's a hungry little guy. So uh, unfortunately, he's, he's still waking up in the middle of the night, still looking for some food. But uh, he's getting big, so I'm hoping that day's – uh, coming to an end at some point, but oh. very blessed, uh, very excited. Uh, obviously, he's already donned some Notre Dame colors. We've had some other uh, other friends send some other university colors, and I always take pictures <laughs> of the gift and say yeah. thank you, but I never I never send a picture of the gift with the baby actually wearing it. So. As, as you should not. As you should not. Like, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not letting anybody in my family wear anything until they want to wear it on their own. How about a Lions one, BQ? Would you do that one? Yeah, we can do a Lions one, of course. Right. Yeah, right. Right. yeah. What's up? With, what's up with the CBS Sports in the background? Don't don't scare Ryan. He loves big no kickoff. Don't give him a heart attack. I, I, well, this is who I work for for the, for the digital streaming world. Right. Uh, I work for CBS Sports HQ, and I was doing some some hits, recording some stuff earlier. So I had it back up in the background. I thought it, it would just keep it up for now. It'd be a little more fitting for it. But I do a little work for for both Fox, both CBS, kind of all over the place at this point. So I, it, that's great. You know, yeah. I'm so glad that that networks kind of allow people to do that. I mean, I get to do that as well. I work for the lock, local Fox station here, and, and they allow me to do this. And uh, I, I took love a while. That, that. Yeah, it took a while. <laughs> it took a while. <laughs> it's not easy. Right. It's not easy. It's, if you do it, you know it's not easy. Yeah. Right. It's not easy. But nonetheless, uh, Brady, happy to have you here. And again, congratulations on the new edition. I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, we're so excited here here in Detroit, collectively as a city and and Detroit Lions fans, to have a guy like Hendon Hooker get drafted by the team in the third round. As as a quarterback yourself, where do you think Hendon Hooker would have gone if he never got hurt? Would he have been a top five guy? Uh, It's hard to tell if he'd be a top five guy, but I think he was definitely a first round talent from watching him just over the course of his career. Even from Virginia Tech to Tennessee, he just continued to get better and better and better and The thing that I kind of always felt like when I was watching him was every single time you put on the tape, you felt like he was better than you thought. He was more accurate than you thought. He had a stronger arm than you thought. He was a better athlete than you thought. Uh, The intangibles as far as the leader, uh, good decision maker, all those things you could tell. But he was always so impressive because every single time you watched him, you're like, this guy just keeps getting better and better and better. And a lot of the guys that I talked to that were able to go to the combine, unfortunately, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, we were, it was too close to the birth of, of our son, so I wasn't able to go this year. But everyone came away saying, you know who impressed me the most? Hendon Hooker. And, and from all accounts, like that is not a surprise uh, given anything you've ever read or, or, or heard about the young man. So I'm excited for him. Uh, I, I think he would have been a first-round pick probably without the injury uh, because that first year, you're, you're probably not you know, really getting much out of him as he looks to recover. I mean, it's not a six-month recovery anymore. It's closer to a 12-month recovery. Right. Uh, but but it's not like the Lions need him right now either. You got Jared Goff. He's been really good there, especially with Ben Johnson, their offensive coordinator. So it gives Hendon Hooker the time to sit back, learn, learn from a veteran and a pro, a guy who's been to a Super Bowl before. Um, and, and also, you got to take into account the system they run in Tennessee is very different than what you're going to get with the Detroit Lions. And so it's going to be a big transition for him, I think, in regards to what he's asked to do pre-snap, post-snap at the quarterback spot. BQ, you opened up Pandora's box, so I will look in it. You talk about Jared Goff, you talk about Hendon Hooker. What is the plan, do you think? And this isn't anything you know. This is just what you think. What do you think the plan is with Hendon Hooker, Jared Goff? Because I don't believe that Brad Holmes is trying to play Jared Goff $250 million at some point. What do you think the course of action is right now in drafting Hendon Hooker? You know, the reality is with, with most players in the NFL, you're on a year-to-year deal. Your contract might not state that, but that's that's what it is. I mean, not everyone's Patrick Mahomes or whoever else you want to throw who's at the top of that list in that conversation. And especially when a team drafts a, a quarterback behind you, 
um, you kind of know that there's a clock that started. Someone likes this guy well enough, obviously, to eventually take my job. Mm -hmm. So um, I would say it all really depends on how this year goes. There's huge expectations for the Lions, and rightfully so. you got to feel good about what Brad Holmes has done, building this roster, what Dan Campbell's done as well, coaching this roster. Um, I think they got a great chance of winning the division, uh, which is something that I don't know that Lions fans can realistically say uh, they've been able to go into a season feeling that way for quite some time. So you now have that in front of you, and because you're the betting favorite and because you've got this momentum now, if that doesn't happen, I think that's where you get some people who maybe want to look for potential change, and we all know who that ends up the fingers pointed at. It's the head coach and it's the quarterback, and I don't think anyone's trying to move on from Dan Campbell. And so unfortunately – it would probably be the quarterback. And and the other thing is, is you get a lot cheaper by playing a quarterback who's on his rookie deal as opposed to a veteran who's going to – even even though Jared Goff's pretty economical for a starter, um, it's still going to be a lot cheaper to go with a rookie. Hey, Brady, we always, we always kind of make a joke of the fact that the Tampa Bay Buccaneers have won the Lions division more recently than the Detroit Lions, and the Bucs have been out of the division for like 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> 96. It's, it's crazy. It, yeah. it is crazy. When you look holistically, though, it does feel like the Lions window is now. And part of that is because of the NFC. If you look at the AFC, I mean, I'm not sure anybody would be talking about the Detroit Lions as a potential division winner. Uh, it, it seems so lopsided, this NFL right now. Um, I, I can't remember a, a time where it's been this lopsided. At least it feels like that. It, it's crazy too, and, and I think you know when we get to the playoffs, and especially when you've got those divisions like last year, you had Tampa, who was a division winner, gets to host a playoff game, they got a losing record, right? Eight like, nine. Yeah, like, like what is up with that, right? The Seattle Seahawks, they actually it happened to them one year, and they actually won their their wild card round game. So, um, you know, what do we know? But that, that's kind of how it works, right? But but that's kind of how it works, right? When it, it's a sudden death scenario, um, you know, I look at it and say it almost calls to you got all these really competitive, really good AFC teams. If, if the NFL overlooks that and goes, you know what? Um, you know, maybe we just need to do a re-rack and we're not taking an even amount from each conference. Maybe, and then the NBA, I think, has talked about it or played with this idea, but um, you end up just taking the, the top 14 teams and, and you end up then reseeding them based off that and how they would be seeded throughout. Now, Ooh. that is a very crazy idea, I'm That's sure, to a lot of traditionalists out there. But if you're talking about trying to ultimately find the very best team in the NFL, it's probably the truest way of doing it. Um, but you're right. It's, it's, it's a packed AFC as far as quarterbacks. And if you don't have a guy that can compete with the likes of a Patrick Mahomes or now Aaron Rodgers or Josh Allen or Joe Burrow, Lamar Jackson, whoever you want to throw in that conversation on that side, Justin Herbert, um, if you don't have one of those guys, you're probably not going to have much of a shot, right? Where the NFC, we look at it and we go, all right, we got Philly and that roster and Jalen Hurts, but – I know San Francisco's got an interesting quarterback situation. Yeah. It's kind of wide open. So you got to feel good if you're an NFC team, feeling like you really do have hope at being able to be that Cinderella, that surprise football team and make it a run this year. Hey, Brady, uh, besides Hendon Hooker, the other parts of the draft, let's start with Gibbs, Campbell, and Branch. What are your thoughts on those three players coming here to Detroit? Do you see them as starters right away? What's your take on them? Yeah, I think when you look at the type of players they are in the current roster, and now obviously we know more after the Gibbs pick and the trade of DeAndre Swift, probably what was happening there, right? They're, they weren't going to be able to extend him, could come to an agreement. So you get a guy who replaces him who's a dynamic playmaker. I mean, Jameer Gibbs reminds me a lot of Alvin Kamara. That's kind of like mm. the comp I think a lot of people yeah. had that for him because you see it. It's like it's easy to see when you see his ability to catch the football, run the football. I have no doubt at all he's going to be an integral part of the offense, the way they move him around and get some of those easy completions and yards after the catch and, and feed him the football because he's very capable. Campbell was like an old-school inside linebacker, off-the-ball linebacker. I mean, we had a chance to see him up in person. I was shocked by how big he was and how well he moved for his size. I mean, he's 250 and about, what, 6'4", something like that, and he is yeah, tall, six, long. Dude, he gets in passing lanes. He can drop into coverage well. He can rush well. He cover, you know, run sideline to sideline. Brady, quick I, I, question. Not to yeah, cut go you off. Is he too slow for the NFL game? And the only reason I no. ask that question, he's 4'5", he's 4'6'5". Typically, at that position nowadays, these guys are 6'2 and a half. They're 2'42", they're 242, 245, and they're running 2 They're running 4'5'5 five, five and lower. Is 4'6'5 too slow? That's the question. I don't think so. I think when you watch him, you know, one of the things that he possesses that you, you can't see in a 40 time or even in a 10-yard split from it 
is how fastly he diagnoses. I mean, he is well coached. He's got no hesitation in his initial read steps when he's watching a player seeing a hole open up. He fires his gun, as, as people would call it, and he goes in and fills that gap when it opens. So, like, I, I think that's one of the more underestimated things because if you think about the NFL, B, how many older linebackers have been doing it for like eight years? How many of them are running fast on a 4 6 5 40? Pro- probably true. not many. This but they've got the experience and the efficiency of movement where they're not taking they're not hesitating they're not taking a false step one way and then and redirecting back the other way they're stepping in they're going and they're going to go fill that holes and, and he's got that that core, sort of football instinct and that that sort of ability about him so i thought they were good at the linebacker spot with Anzalone there and Malcolm Rodriguez after his rookie year but it's hard when if you're Brad Holmes and and you've got these guys really highly rated you got to trust it and you got to say we're going to draft players that, yeah, you might not think that we need them, but there's always injuries. Like I said before, to start off, everyone's on like a lot of pretty a one-year deal. So if we feel like this guy's going to make our roster and be an impactful player day one, you got to take them. If you're there and sitting there, you you got to take those guys. So I'm a, I'm a huge Jameer Gibbs fan. I was a big Jack Campbell fan. And I love the fact that, and Branch as well, I love the fact that the Lions are doing it their way. Like it wasn't conventional. And some people were like, what was that? I loved it. I was like, this, these are the type of yeah. football players that are going to make your team better because Dan Campbell is going to find a way of plugging them in and making it work. Yeah, Brad Holmes is definitely on his Frank Sinatra doing it his way type of thing. You spoke about Alex Anzalone, who was drafted in 2017. Somebody else drafted in 2017 was Cam Sutton, the newest DB for the Detroit Lions. We got him coming on the show uh, in a little bit. Talk about what he's going to be for that secondary, considering last year that was one of their biggest weak points. It was, and, and I think you, and you look at when they moved on from a guy like Jeff Akuda, you're like, wait a second, what are we doing here? Yeah. But they have some versatility. That was obviously a position, too, that they addressed in the draft, uh, but also in free agency. And, and he's a player that I think he's versatile enough, too, to do a bunch of different things within their scheme and what they want to do. Uh, so I'll be curious to see how they end up using him. Um, but I think he's a great addition to that defense. Uh, if you really, if you really want to be honest about it, they can kind of only go up from here. Um, so, you know, at, at this point, I, I think again, he's a welcome addition. He's going to help out that secondary and the variety of coverages and things that they can do, as compared to last year, where it just you felt like at times um, they were really struggling uh, to be able to, you know, figure out what worked and at least hang your hat on that. Like we always talk about offenses with an identity. I always felt like when you're watching tape and you're preparing for a defense. When you hit a big play on a, on a defensive coordinator, sometimes they kind of have a coverage or a safe defense they play on that next first and ten play, and, and like they, it's almost like, well, hey, this is what we know we can do well. We're not going to allow the, the bleeding to, to continue. I don't know that at times in Detroit you felt like they really had that, at least defensively last year. I think they're going to have a better idea of what they're really good at defensively this year. Uh, talking to Brady Quinn, uh, former NFL quarterback, Braylon's quarterback, too, with the Browns. Of course, uh, Notre Dame quarterback, a big noon kickoff, Fox NFL Sunday. Mike, uh, could you stop doing game something? Man. This keeps getting longer and longer and longer, 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 longer. It's crazy. So many jobs I can't list it. It's so great. Father. Uh, Brady, I do want to ask you about the college game, though. Um, you know, obviously here we're, we're, we're Michigan uh, fans, Michigan people. It feels like Michigan has nothing left to prove other than go win a freaking playoff game, uh, go win a national championship. Is that what this season now is all about, a national championship or or kind of bust? I mean, they're over the Ohio State thing. They're over the Michigan thing. It's like they have to push forward now, don't they? Yeah, I think so. I mean, that's definitely what's the only thing left out there for them. Um, I, I mean, obviously, you, you you got Ohio State coming to your house this year. You've owned them the past two years. I mean, it's been physical domination. Uh, and and to be quite frank, I mean, it's it was a bit shocking. I mean, having a chance to watch both teams last year, I really thought they were pretty evenly matched. And the fourth quarter in Columbus, Michigan just explodes. And it's, and it's you have an entirely different feel. And so I really felt like it was going to end up being Georgia-Michigan playing for the national championship. I would have loved for it to play out that way. And, and, and this is no disrespect to TCU. I just feel like it would have been more competitive when it was all said and done. I but, hope so. They lost by 80. <laughs> yeah. And, and but the reality is, look, TCU beat Michigan. So it, you can say whatever you want. But Ooh, when the game, well, I, I'm not. It's just the reality of the situation. Sure. You know, I, I think when you look at two teams scoring off and they play 10 times, Michigan's going to beat TCU probably the majority of, of those opportunities. It just happened to be the day where it wasn't Michigan's day. Um, all that being said, they should be one of the favorites. Like, I look at them as the favorite, obviously, to win the Big Ten this year. I look at them to be one of the you know, four playoff teams. If I had to pick right now, they're a part of that group. 
Um, and I think that's the really only thing left for this group. Um, you know, when you look at J.J. McCarthy, his next step, like how does he become that guy we talk about along with Caleb Williams, along with Drake May? He's got to go out there and just flourish and, and carry this team at times. You know, I think the ground attack with obviously Quorum and, and, and Edwards, those guys have really been carrying the team. And, and the offensive line has been phenomenal. But it's now time for him to kind of take main stage and be the guy. And he's going to have to be, I think, in moments this year. But you'd have to think that they're the favorite. The way um, Jim Harbaugh has has recruited, the way he's developed, the culture that he's built there, they've, they've got everything going in the right direction. And I think the crazy thing is, is if you look at Ohio State post-Urban Meyer, you know, it's really hard to take on a program that's been successful and follow a guy who won a national championship – and was able to get you know win Big Ten championships and get back to the playoff. What becomes difficult is then figuring out like how do you make your own changes to the program to make it your own and put your own fingerprints on it because you don't want to mess with something that's been working, but you also you have to be original and you have to do it in a genuine way that that's more of your stamp on it. I know it may have take taken Michigan a while for for you know people who've. And hoping that Jim Harbaugh would get this point. Uh, well, it, it was a slow build, but they're here. And, and yeah. now they're dominating. I think that's the problem for Ohio State is they've lost their identity. They, they, they've kind of lost that identity of, of what made them successful versus Michigan. And I think in the, on, to contrary to that is Michigan now is built up where you know exactly what their identity is. You know exactly what they're going to get from them week in and week out. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, Brady. I remember when Michigan lost their identity uh, kind of sort of around that 2007 yeah. and 2008. We remember when Michigan lost to Lloyd Leff, and it looked, it looked interesting for a while. We're going to let you go. You're always so giving uh, of your time. Just two quick things. You got on a maroon shirt. We had a guy in the studio last Friday that was wearing some maroon shirt for the Michigan Panthers. Big E was in the studio representing the Michigan Panthers. Thoughts on how good of a person Big E was. I actually met Big E. Well, I knew Big E, but I got a chance to really meet him with you. Uh, he is a wonderful human being. Uh, I'm a huge Big E fan. Um, I, I, I obviously, the, the theatrics, everything that he does for professional wrestling, but even beyond that, I mean, he's a smart guy, very business savvy. As I said to you, though, I was like, man, that can't all be real. But he's like, no, it's all real, man. It's just hard work. I mean, <laughs> when you see how big he is in person, yeah. it is astonishing. Like someone could literally make themselves that yoked up that big. So uh, <laughs> love, love, love Big E, man. He is he is as entertaining as it gets. The reason why the reason why I told you, yes, it definitely has to be natural because I feel like God was like, look, we're going to make this guy. It's going to be all natural. He's going to be Jack, but we're going to make him real slow and we're going to make him real short. So I figured hey, that's the trade-off. That was the trade-off. Hey, hey, Brady, before we let you go, um, congratulations, too, on your MBA. I, I, I think that is so freaking cool, man. Uh, I see a lot of uh, these athletes. Uh, I think I, I can't remember. Of course, now I can't remember, but I saw somebody walking across the stage at graduation. It was an NFL player, and I just I think that's the greatest thing in the world uh, when you have the ability to go back to school and and get a degree. So congratulations to you. You've got so much, uh, so many great things happening for yeah. you. Big fans of yours, and I can't thank you enough. I appreciate that, guys. You know, I, it's unfortunate. I'm not going to be able to walk. Um, we actually had a death in our family, and obviously, you know, B, I, I know you're dealing with some stuff too. Yeah. So prayers to you and your family. But same to you. Uh, it, it's unfortunate. It, it worked out that way. I, I didn't get to walk for my undergraduate degree. Now I don't get to walk for this oh. either. But Oh, uh, now I gotta well, figure out what to do with the degree. Degrees, right? I mean, Jesus. No. Weren't you a double no, major but... coming out? I, I was. I was. But they only give you one degree for that. So I got a degree in finance. <laughs> and my second major was poli sci. Oh, and I'm in I'm broadcasting, so I'm school. not doing any of that. <laughs> I was an economics major. I'm in broadcasting. It, <laughs> it just go. happens. Yeah. It just happens. Brady, I'm sorry for your loss, uh, number one. But uh, congratulations to you. Continued success, my friend. And we'll talk to you down the road here. Thanks, BQ. Thanks, guys. Always, but uh, always, uh, just such a great, uh, such a great uh, time to have BQ on. I want to be so, BQ in my I next wanna, life. I, <laughs> I really do. I want to come back yeah. and be. I do. <laughs> Forget so a movie star. I, I, I want to be him. I want to be him. <laughs>